Hello, it's my special joy and privilege to be part of the inaugural activities of establishing the first annual Congress of the Mexican Society of Lifestyle Medicine. I'm Dr. Hans Diehl, and I'm looking forward to spending some time with you. I greatly appreciated the invitation by your president, Victor Sadia, to discuss the role of diet in the context of our common chronic diseases. It has been a wonderful experience in working with your president and also with Laura Rodriguez, your executive coordinator, to begin to prepare for this inaugural event. They assigned me to discuss the complicity of diet in the cause and cure of chronic diseases. I mean, is there really a relationship between diet and today's prominent chronic diseases? And so, in my first of three lectures, I want to talk to you about fork and knife, weapons of mass destruction, the role of diet in the etiology of circulation-related chronic diseases. Of course, since I don't know in detail the Mexican health and disease statistics, I need to give you this presentation as seen through the lens of the American statistics. With the spread of the American culture, and especially with the spread of the American diet, moving towards becoming a global force the Mexican mortality and morbidity statistics tragically will probably move closer and closer to those of the United States as well. In America, 30% of all deaths are now due to cardiovascular disease, that's heart disease and strokes, 30%. Now, interestingly enough, the Mexican statistics for cardiovascular disease are at 25% of deaths which are lower than those in the United States, but they're creeping up. Did you know that heart disease has not always been with us to the extent that we have it today? Here's a medical textbook written in 1920 by Sir William Osler. He wrote, in the United States, you can expect one heart attack a year in an average hospital in an average sized town. Now, that's how it was then one heart attack a year in an average sized town. But today, things have changed in America. We now have 3,000 heart attacks every day, with cardiovascular disease being responsible for every one out of three deaths. Now, in Mexico today, cardiovascular disease is now responsible for every one out of four deaths, but the numbers are creeping up. Now, look at breast cancer trends in America. In 1960, one in 20 women could expect to become a victim of breast cancer. Today, it's one in seven. But the incidence rates have not only gone up significantly for breast cancer, but also they have gone up for colon cancer and prostate cancer. Now, let's look at the common form of diabetes, type 2 diabetes. An enormous increase has taken place in the United States. The number of diagnosed diabetics now doubles every 10 years in our society, responsible for 6% of all deaths. Similar statistics have emerged in Mexico. Here, too, since 1960, the number of diagnosed diabetics has doubled every 10 years, accounting now for 16% of all deaths, which is 2.5 times higher than those in the United States. And look what happened to the chairs in America. From 1900 to 1970, the size of the average chair didn't really change all that much. It went from 43 centimeters to 45 centimeters. Basically, it didn't change at all. But then look what happened. Today, the average size in America is no longer 45 centimeters, but now it's 61 centimeters. So what happened? Did they have too much lumber that they had to, had to get rid of? And so they begin to build larger chairs in the United States? Well, <laughs> well, in the United States, the prevalence of obesity among adult women is now 41%. The prevalence of obesity in adult women in Mexico now is 37%. But again, it's creeping up with the gap between the United States and Mexico narrowing with time. And of course, it's not only diabetes that is increasing with obesity, but also high blood pressure, heart disease, arthritis, asthma, sleep apnea, and the various cancers. They're all related to excess weight. 
Well, there was a time when people came to me and explained to me that the increase in these non-communicable diseases was related to the, the disease of old age. They said, well, actually, the main reason for this increase in these chronic diseases over the last 50 and 100 years has to be found in the fact that people today live so much longer. And of course, they have to die of something. Well, not quite. Here you see some American data comparing chronic disease rates of 1996 with those of 2012. And please note, regardless of the age, whether it's 45 to 64 years or 61 to 79 or the age bracket above 80 years of age, in every age bracket, the chronic disease rates have increased by more than 50% during those 16 years. The increase in these chronic diseases, then, is not driven by a longer life. Then, what is driving these higher chronic disease rates? How do we explain that? Well, today we have modern medications, we have more medical care, we have more budgets for medical interventions, and yet the diseases, these chronic diseases, are on the run. Could it be the diet? Well. Let me show you what happened in 1972. It began in America and it spread around the world. It was a time when we began to shift from slow foods to fast foods. When we shifted from eating at home to eating out. It was the birthing of the fast food industry. Well, initially the numbers were very small, but look what happened. Over the next 30 to 50 years, they actually grew exponentially. And today, 48% of the food is taken out. We no longer eat at home. We're eating out. And those gustatory food changes did not stop at the American-Mexican border. No, no, no. Don't people find themselves at home in Mexico with McDonald's, Burger Kings, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Dairy Queens? Has Mexico not become another home for American fast foods? And that is probably not to your advantage. We have learned a lot from epidemiological studies by looking at different population groups. For instance, when the Western culture, the dietary Western lifestyle invaded Japan and China, circulatory diseases were very, very rare in those countries. After all, these people lived largely on a very simple, starch-based, traditional diet. Very simple foods. But diseases like heart disease and strokes, hearing loss and impotence, yeah, these are all circulation-related diseases. These diseases became quite common as the diets became westernized. Let me give you some examples. Take Japan, 1952. Heart disease, very rare. Difficult to find. It was so rare that the medical school at the University of Tokyo had to purchase narrowed coronary arteries from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore so that they could show the medical students in Japan what killed every second American. Interesting, isn't it? Of course, the medical schools in Japan today no longer have to purchase coronary arteries from people who have died from heart disease in America because Japan, over time, has become self-sufficient. With the influx of the Western diet, the Japanese now grow their own coronary artery disease. Or take China, 1978. Or take the small Baltic country of Lithuania, a satellite state of the Soviet Union after World War I. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989 and Lithuania became a democracy again, they kicked out the Russians, and everything began to change. Free elections, free market concepts, and they also brought in the Western culture, and with that, the Western foods. And some 30 years later, the death rates from heart disease have doubled in Lithuania, being now twice as high as those in America. Now, let's take a good look at the 1970s in America. This was the very time when America was undergoing a major dietary change, a huge dietary change that since then has spread across the world. This was the time when we shifted from whole foods to fractionated foods. We shifted from slow foods 
to fast foods. We shifted from eating at home to eating out. We no longer ate potatoes, we began to eat potato chips. We no longer ate corn, began to eat corn chips. We no longer ate oats, we began to eat Oreos. <laughs> and we no longer ate beans, we began to eat burgers. And instead of drinking water, we began to consume soft drinks. And instead of being lean, we became large. And with that, a dramatic shift in the diet composition took place. With an increase in disposable income, the green columns representing the starchy energy in the national diet became smaller and smaller. At the same time, the blue colored protein columns increased more and more, particularly the amount of protein coming from animal sources. But don't overlook the increase in the yellow colored sugar columns and the increase in the red colored animal fats and vegetable fats and columns featuring oil. It's a total overhaul of the national diet, where sugar and fat have become now the major foodstuffs that we eat. The dietary overhaul of our national diet can be broken down into two major dietary shifts. The first shift was from foods to products. We no longer eat foods, we eat industrialized products. We have increasingly shifted away from whole foods as they come to us in nature. Instead, we have sh increasingly shifted towards a refined, engineered diet. And this, of course, has really increased the consumption of sugar. We are no longer eating just two teaspoons of sugar per person per day. That was at one time. Today, we're consuming 30 teaspoons of sugar per person per day with most of that sugar coming from refined soft drinks, from cakes and pies, or from products like you see here, yeah, a banana split. But we have also sharply increased our consumption of refined calories coming from refined fats and oils. Did you know that it takes 14 ears of corn to produce one tablespoon of corn oil? And that one tablespoon of corn oil represents 200 calories, and how long will it take you to eat those 200 calories of corn oil? Ha, no time. You put this corn oil into your potato salad, and before you know it, you have a small tsunami of calories coming in. Imagine, in the old days, without the industrialized oil extracting procedures, you would have to eat those 200 calories of oil in their original form. You would have to eat 14 ears of corn to get those 200 calories. Could you do it? <laughs> but with corn oil so readily available nowadays, you can easily take some of these corn chips. But take a closer look. You can now take one small bag of 250 grams of corn chips, and how long do you think it would take you to eat those? Well, <laughs> you just inhale them, right? They're gone. And you just consumed 1,440 calories. You know, that's the number of calories that some women should have for the whole day. Think about this. In that innocent looking bag of corn chips, 90 grams of fat. And many nutrition experts today probably recommend to have no more than 35 to 50 grams of fat for the whole day. Chips of any kind, lots of oil, lots of fat, lots of calories, lots of salt, little nutrition. Calorie dense, and nutritionally poor. Or take a closer look at potatoes. Let's take 200 grams of potatoes and 200 grams of potato chips. Please take a good look. When you take 200 grams of potatoes, you just have 105 calories. But when you on the left side, as you see here, take 200 grams of potato chips, this time you will get 1,050 calories which means you get 10 times as many calories for the same amount of weight. The food refinement process with the addition of fat has drastically altered the caloric density of the original product. Refined foods are usually concentrating the calories because they have added the fats and oil, and often they have removed the fiber, which provides bulk for the original naturally occurring food.
And of course, industrial food producers know this. They know we love the sweetness of sugar. They know we love the taste of salt. They know we love that fat feel in our mouths. They know what turns us on. They know how to capture and hijack our pleasure centers in the brain. That's why people today talk about sugar and salt and fat as addictive substances, substances that can hook us. Or to make my point, look how sugar and fat cause a concentration of calories in the form of this milkshake. This is a large milkshake of 2000 calories. We enjoy the taste totally unaware of the caloric overload. And some people actually think about these kind of things as innocent, innocuous, harmless little snacks. Now be careful. The larger the snacks, <laughs> the larger the slacks. Happens all the time. Be aware of what happens when you concentrate calories and the effect it has on our bodies. Overweight. By turning whole foods as grown into engineered products, it really shouldn't surprise us when we see that some 44% of our calories consumed in America today have very little nutritional value. They're devoid of nutritional content, they're called empty calories, and ironically, in a country of dietary abundance like America, many of us are overfed and undernourished, malnourished amid of plenty. Here is Dr. Walter Willett from Harvard University. He wrote, the transition from food to becoming an industrialized product has become a foundational problem, especially in the area of circulation-related diseases, because the actual processing of food has stripped the food of its nutrition and concentrated its calories with adverse health effects. So, this is the first shift in our diet, moving more and more towards refined processed foods. But there's a second shift, and that is the increase in the consumption of animal products. Here you see, we used to consume about 56 kilos per person a year, but today it's more like close to 100 kilos. We have almost doubled the amount of animal products over the last 100 years in America. Would you have imagined that in America we today consume in a lifetime 12 cows, 25 hogs, and we eat 2,400 chickens per person. And yet people oftentimes come to me and they say, well, sir, but we need to have some protein, don't we? Well, look at that sirloin steak in the middle of the chart. Look at the calories coming from protein. That's about 25%, but 75% of the calories are coming from fat. Or look at those spare ribs at the bottom there. This is even worse in that only 20% of the calories are coming from protein, but 80% of the calories are coming from fat. Interestingly enough, some 75% of the fat we eat is very well hidden. That makes it easy to take in too much fat and too many calories. But where do these fat calories come from? The number one carrier of fat in the American diet is meat, poultry, fish, and dairy. These animal products represent half of all the fat we eat. And when you add salad oils and shortening for another 31% of our fat calories that we consume, you can see then how fats and oils can add up very quickly in our diet. Animal products, and then salad oils and shortening. Well, what about processed meat, like hamburgers and hot dogs and salami and luncheon meats? Well, take a look at the bottom of this slide. That's the American hot dog, 15% protein and 85% fat. Or look at that salami, that's 17% protein and 83% fat. But it's not just the calories and the fat that we're concerned about. The World Health Organization declared after much research that these processed meats were actually carcinogenic, just like tobacco, asbestos, and diesel fuel, cancer-causing, contributing to and causing cancer. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I think that many of us may not have fully understood the well-documented danger of moving into a Western kind of a diet. On one hand, you need to be concerned about the processed foods, calorically dense and nutritionally poor. On the other hand, you need to be concerned about the abundance of animal products with their saturated fat, their lack of fiber, and their cancer-contributing effect. Well, what about dairy foods? Did you know that some 71% of the calories in cheese is actually coming from fat? And most of it is saturated fat? Or when you, for instance, look at Philadelphia cream cheese, that's about 90% fat. And look at the increase in the cheese consumption over the last 100 years. We've gone from 1.7 kilograms to now 18 kilograms per person per year. And with that, cheese has become the number one source of saturated fat. These saturated fats in the diet, found mostly in animal products, but also in oriental oils, have been clearly identified in large international studies as directly contributing to the synthesis of cholesterol by the liver. And it's a high level of cholesterol that's primarily involved in the pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease. It's the cholesterol numbers in the blood that drive the cardiovascular disease epidemic. Now, let me give you some example uh, where you find the saturated fat. What is the saturated fat content of some of our foods? Well, here it is. Butter is 63% saturation. Beef fat is 50% saturation. Olive oil is 15% saturation. Palm oil is 78% saturation. And then look at coconut oil. <laughs> With 92% being saturated, it takes the cake. Coconut oil drives the production of cholesterol by the liver more than any other fat, largely affecting the blood cholesterol levels, which then in turn greatly influence the rate of atherosclerosis and thus circulatory diseases. That's why the American Heart Association recently went on record to state, we recommend coconut oil. And then they added, but use it only on your scalp or your skin, never put into your mouth. Even so, often people come to me and they say, but uh, olive oil is okay, isn't it? That's a healthy oil, right? Well, it doesn't make any difference whether you consume olive oil or coconut oil because there is no good fat or oil for you if you want to lose weight because every gram of any kind of fat is 9 calories, which makes fat the most calorie-rich energy carrier. Starch, on the other hand, only has 4 calories per gram. So if you want to lose weight, be careful about any kind of fat because regardless of the kind of fat, every gram has 9 calories. And so here now you have the standard American diet with its taste sensations and its convenience and its availability. This kind of a diet has become the envy of the world. But take a closer look at this new diet. 55% of the calories now come from refined and processed food. 31% of all the calories, in addition, come from dairy and animal products. And only, and here's the point, only 14% of our calories come from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, and some nuts. Only 14% of the calories that we eat come from foods as grown. And most nutritional experts and scientists are very clear that we should really increase the consumption of foods as they come in nature. The fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, and plenty of legumes, namely the beans, the lentils, and peas. The foods as grown with modest amounts of sugar, salt, and fat, and oils. That's the prescription. This is a more traditional diet used in Mexico. But we have lost this traditional foods more and more and replaced it with modern processed engineered foods. But industrialized processed foods and animal products have taken tragically over countries everywhere. Do they impact our level of health? Here's Dr. Walter Willett, again from Harvard University. He said, epidemiologists, scientists who study the epidemics of these diseases have long known 
that the major determinants of our killer diseases are dietary and lifestyle factors. So, does diet make a difference? Well, let's take a closer look at heart disease. You see the coronary arteries sitting on top of the heart muscle here? Next, you're looking at the cross-section of a coronary artery. You see the outside ring? This is the actual arterial wall, but all the stuff that narrows the lumen of the artery is on the inside is the atherosclerotic plaque that consists largely of cholesterol and fats and calcium and dead cells. By narrowing and hardening the arteries, it undermines the optimal blood flow to the heart muscle, which is so dependent on the delivery of oxygen and nutrients. To give you some idea, let me show you a short video clip. I think this is very uh, illustrative of what is really happening when it comes to these uh, circulation-related diseases. Heart attacks, certain cancers, osteoporosis, diabetes. The major diseases of our society may be caused in part by what we eat. I first woke up, so to speak, when I was working on the anesthesia service, learning how to put people to sleep. And I was seeing my patients for the next day's surgery for coronary artery bypass surgery in order to bypass clogged arteries in their heart. Because it was late at night, I drew the man's blood test. And when I took the blood to the laboratory and had it processed, I couldn't believe my eyes. Now, normally, this liquid layer floating on top of the blood clot is quite transparent. It's a yellow, but quite clear. You can see right through it. The blood in this patient's tube, however, was anything but clear. The serum floating on his clot was thick and greasy white. It looked like glue. In fact, it stuck to the sides of the blood tube when I shook the tube. I went back to the patient. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital tonight? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized that what I was looking at in his tube was all the fat in the beef burger, all the butter fat in the cheese, and the butter fat in the ice cream and in the milkshake. And all this fat had oozed out into his blood and actually turned his blood fatty. Well, 30, 40, 50 years of keeping your blood very fatty creates changes in the blood vessels that are very dangerous. Over the years, arteries can become clogged with fatty material. Then a blood clot can form, blocking the blood flow completely. If the artery leads to the heart, the lack of oxygen can cause heart muscle to die. That's a heart attack. If the clogged artery leads to the brain, the patient has a stroke. The next morning, we took Mr. Phillips to the operating room, and I put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest. And from these arteries, he began pulling out yellow, greasy deposits of fatty material called atherosclerosis. Did you see that? You just saw the underlying disease process for all circulatory diseases. Here you saw the pathologies, atherosclerosis, inflammatory processes that cause the arteries to become progressively hardened and narrowed. Here you see what progressively happens from birth to 70 years of age. This atherosclerotic buildup can actually begin, it can actually have its genesis based on the diet of the mother in utero, affecting the unborn child. It's amazing. We think of heart disease as something that happens when you're 70, 80 years of age. No, it has its genesis in utero. So many of these atherosclerotic processes are gradual and largely asymptomatic. For 40% of the people, the first symptom of this narrowing process is tragically sudden death. There's not much you can do after that. This then relates prominently to the development of soft and small plaques that can suddenly break off and obstruct an artery, shutting off the blood supply to the myocardium and causing the myocardial infarction. Angina pectoris is a clinical symptom where usually some 70% or more of the arterial luminal space has become lost because of the atherosclerotic process that is filling in the space. Once people experience angina pectoris, they are largely assured 
that the narrowing and hardening process is interfering with sufficient oxygen delivery because of insufficient blood flow. These atherosclerotic lesions then are not a natural process of aging. They have to do with our lifestyle and especially with our dietary lifestyle. But these atherosclerotic processes affect not only our coronary arteries, atherosclerosis is a systemic process. It doesn't stop at the coronary arteries, it can afflict most of our major arteries in the body. Here you see the clinical expression of these underlying narrowing processes. If they affect the arteries to and in the brain, then the result can be a cerebral infarction, a stroke, cognitive and memory loss, hearing loss, visual loss. They're all related to the deterioration of the arterial system. If they affect the kidney arteries, then you have to be concerned about hypertension and ultimately renal failure. If they affect the penal arteries, thus interfering with sustaining blood flow, then you have to be concerned about erectile dysfunction and impotence. This kind of a situation where you have impotence is actually oftentimes called the canary in the coal mine because erectile dysfunction emerges often as the first sign of this systemic process. And there's more. If uh, these processes affect the arteries to the feet, as in the case of diabetics, then you have to be concerned about gangrene and the clinical sequela, amputations, and all the things that come with that. Many diseases with many names in many locations of the body, treated by many medical specialists, yet one underlying pathology, atherosclerotic and inflammatory processes that interfere with optimal blood flow, thus undermining the health of the end organ that are supposed to be fed by these arteries. The question then comes up oftentimes, what are the underlying risk factors for this narrowing process? These risk factors here on this arch emerged from the famous Framingham study. The closer these factors are to the top of the arch, the greater their weight in driving these diseases. So here you see at the top of the arch, LDL cholesterol. Then you have smoking and high blood pressure. These are the classical risk factors that drive atherosclerosis and the circulatory diseases. But you also must be concerned about diabetes and obesity and triglycerides. And then on the right hand side, uh, you may want to be uh, concerned about inactivity, stress, and at times some genetic factors. And of course, at the bottom you see you have age and gender. Well, there is not much you can do about age and gender. All the other risk factors, fortunately, you can change because they're lifestyle related. They relate to what we eat and what we do or don't do. Just to give you some idea, if you have a very high cholesterol, you have high blood pressure, you're a diabetic, you're a smoker, and you have a positive EKG, then the chances of a 35-year-old man of having a heart attack within the next six years is 140 times higher than if he had an ideal cholesterol like 150 or an ideal systolic blood pressure of under 120. No smoking, no diabetes, and a normal treadmill test. Most of these factors we can influence. And with that, we can influence our common circulation related chronic diseases. They are largely lifestyle related diseases but take a closer look at the yellow dietary stars, cholesterol, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, obesity, triglycerides, and they are largely influenced by our diet. And usually they can be reduced and lowered very quickly within three to four weeks. You can bring your cholesterol down by 20% in three to four weeks. There's no problem, we do it all the time. So let me focus for just a few months on the blood cholesterol issue. Here's the famous Mr. Fit study, the multiple risk factor intervention trial. This was a primary prevention trial for heart disease. The researchers screened some 350,000 people and enrolled ultimately 12,800 in the study. 
They then followed them for 16 years, and the results were absolutely astonishing. Those people with the lowest blood cholesterol also had the lowest death rates from heart disease. Take a look. Comparing the lowest cholesterol levels of 150 with the highest cholesterol level of 300 differentiated the coronary death rates by close to five times. Those with the lowest cholesterol experienced four deaths per 1,000 people. Those with the highest cholesterol experienced 18 deaths per 1,000 people, an almost five-fold differential in the number of coronary deaths. So when it comes to avoiding and reversing atherosclerosis and heart disease, nothing seems to be more important than to get the cholesterol numbers below the ideal of 160, 150, as you find in many societies where you cannot find heart disease. How can we consider cholesterol levels of 200 as normal as we do in our society? Cholesterol levels of 200 are only normal for people who normally die from heart disease. And you don't want to be normal. You want to be ideal. And an ideal cholesterol level should be below 160. So, here's Dr. Jeremiah Stamler, the mastermind of the Mr. Fit study. He said, 87% of all major coronary events before the age of 65 could be prevented if Americans would get their cholesterol below 180 and their systolic blood pressures below 125. And then in 1978, he said in his famous lecture, he said, it's further reasonable and sound to designate rich diet as the primary, the essential, and the necessary cause of the current epidemic of premature atherosclerotic disease raging in Western industrialized societies. Cigarette smoking and hypertension, yeah, they play their role, they're important, but they're important secondary and complementary causes. To Dr. Stambler, the primary cause, the essential cause, the necessary cause, rich diet. And then here you have Dr. Antonio Gotto, then the president of the American Heart Association, addressing the Senate in 1977. He said, in societies with blood cholesterol levels below 160, it's virtually impossible to find heart disease or atherosclerosis. The question then is, what drives these cholesterol levels? What are the determinants of the blood cholesterol? Well, we have to think about cholesterol itself, the dietary cholesterol, which is only found in animal products. So number one, cholesterol is only found in animal products. It increases the blood cholesterol. Number two, we have to also think about saturated fat, which influences the biosynthesis rate of cholesterol by the liver. So the liver produces cholesterol and adds significantly, in a major fashion, to the dietary cholesterol coming from animal products. And then you have number three, we also have to include natural soluble fiber in our diet, which helps to lower the cholesterol in the blood. In summary then, the three factors that largely determine the cholesterol in our bloodstream are found in our diet, the cholesterol and the saturated fat and the soluble fiber that we eat. Now, let's see if we can apply what these researchers found. They found that for every 1% increase in blood cholesterol, the coronary risk increases by two and a half times. What does that mean? It means that every 1% increase in blood cholesterol translates into two and a half times more likelihood of developing heart disease. Let me give you an example. If you dropped your cholesterol from 250 to 200, which you can do in 30 days by making some dietary changes. So if you dropped your cholesterol by 50 points from 250 to 200 points, that would represent a 20% drop in your original blood cholesterol number, right? That 20% drop times 2.5 would then equal 50% in terms of reducing the coronary risk. This means that a 20% drop in blood cholesterol would reduce your coronary risk, your heart attack risk by 50%, and you can cut your coronary risk in half, and you can do that in most cases within 30 days by just making some simple dietary changes 
as we do in our CHIP program, the Complete Health Improvement Program. Well, let's take a look at the CHIP program, which I developed some 30 years ago. More than 100,000 people have graduated from this 30-hour intensive education program. It's designed to help people to make better lifestyle choices and to move them towards a whole food plant-based diet, more native foods, more foods as they come in nature, more traditional foods, lots of fruits and vegetables and lots of whole grains and lots of beans and more nuts. That would fit into the Mexican uh, society, wouldn't it? Well, here you see some of the results that we have published in more than 40 peer-reviewed scientific papers. In this article, we had 126 people with cholesterol numbers initially above 280. 30 days later, their cholesterol levels had dropped 20%, thus cutting their corner risk in half, 50% reduction. And here you have Dr. William Connor, a professor of medicine who, after years of research with animals, wrote, to create heart disease in animals is very easy. All you have to do is give these animals, number one, a diet rich in saturated fat and cholesterol, which you find in animal products, and of course in coconut oil. And number two, give them trans fats commonly found in processed foods. <laughs> yeah, again, processed foods, engineered foods, and animal products. And then here you have Dr. William Castelli, the former director of the Framingham Heart Study. He said, if you want to create coronary artery disease in monkeys, all you have to do is feed them a typical American hospital diet. Well, <laughs> that's something to think about, isn't it? Huge studies at Harvard University have documented that dietary changes can prevent 70% of stroke, 71% of cancers, 82% of heart disease, and prevent 91% of diabetes. Why don't we do this? And then here you have Tommy Thompson. He was then the Secretary of the American Health and Human Services Department of the government, and he wrote, our nation's largest killer diseases are largely lifestyle related, and they can therefore be prevented or delayed. They're not prevented by vaccines. They're not cured by pills and procedures. They are largely an extension of our health-damaging behaviors, our use of tobacco, our lack of exercise, and our rich diet. And here then you have the former Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. C. Everett Koop. He wrote in his report to the nation, there is nothing that influences long-term health prospects more than what we eat. Well, is there a relation between diet and circulatory diseases? Well, let me take you to some observational studies, major studies done at Loma Linda in California, where I live. Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> as I'm looking outside my window, I can actually see the medical complex, the university, and the headquarters of the Adventist Health Studies. These studies gave rise to the understanding that Adventists are some of the longest living people in the world. Let me give you some examples. Here is my neighbor, Dr. Ellsworth Wareham, when he was 104 years of age. And then <laughs> you see Marge Jetton when she was 106. These are North America's longevity stars. Can you imagine Dr. Wareham was still doing open heart surgery at 95? And when I asked him, isn't that kind of stressful? And he said, come on, Hans, it's a cinch. I've done it for so many years, it's easy. I can do it in my sleep almost. And what are the characteristics of the blue zones in general? I've picked three for you, Loma Linda, Sardinia, and Okinawa in Japan. What do these areas with their many centenarians have in common? Supportive networks, no smoking, plant-based diets, with lots of beans and whole grains, moderate exercise, and social engagement. In addition, Adventists, which I guess is the Loma Linda group, are known for eating some nuts every day. And people of Sardinia are known for having plenty of flava beans and enjoying some wine from time to time. And then you have the people of Okinawa in Japan. They are known for not having any time urgency. They're relaxed. 
they have empowered women and they enjoy gardening and they enjoy sunshine. Is there something else in the Adventist group that makes them so unique? What are some of the lifestyle factors that enable Adventists to live longer than anybody else in North America? No smoking, no alcohol, a weekly rest day. They're religious people. They don't miss too many worship services on their weekends. They have spiritual resources and they have good social support structures. But while those 20 million Adventists around the world embrace a fairly homogeneous lifestyle, no smoking, no alcohol, and so on, there's a dietary diversity that makes Adventists an ideal group to study of what the dietary component of their longevity might be. Many of these Adventists are meat eaters. Others are lacto-ovo vegetarians. And then there are some who are pure vegetarians. We sometimes call them vegans. Researchers in the 1980s comparing the heart disease death rates of some 25,000 Adventists living in California with the general California population found that Adventist meat eaters had only 64% of the expected death rate, which was largely contributed to the fact that Adventists don't smoke and smoking contributes to heart disease. But when the researchers compared Adventist meat eaters with Adventist lacto over vegetarians, and then with Adventists that were pure vegetarians, they found that the best outcome in health was found among the pure vegetarians, in that they had only one-third the number of deaths from heart disease compared to their meat-eating church members. In addition, they found in this study that Adventist lacto-vegetarians, when compared to Adventist meat-eaters, had lower blood pressures, uh, less arthritis, less prostate cancer, and only half the rate of colon cancer, all contributing to a longer life expectancy compared to meat-eating Adventists. So, moving towards a diet that is leaving the animal product sort of on the sidelines certainly has its benefits, doesn't it? Of course, when these uh, data came out, uh, it was uh, an earth-shaking finding and encouraged the National Institutes of Health and other governmental agencies to fund a second study with an enrollment of 96,500 Adventists across North America. The researchers categorized these participants very carefully according to their dietary habits, and they found that about 9% of these Adventists in North America were pure vegetarians, 31% were lacto-ovo vegetarians, 10% were fish-eating vegetarians, and about 50% were meat eaters. So if we follow these different dietary groups for five to 10 years, will different disease rates emerge in these different dietary groups? Could diet really make a difference? And here are some of the clinical outcomes after a seven year follow-up. Weight issues. Adventist meat-eating women, this is the red bar there, on average weight 82 kilograms those following a pure vegetarian diet, the green bar, however, only weighed 64 kilograms, which was a difference of 18 kilograms. The same held true for Adventist men that you see on this slide here to the right-hand side. Meat-eating men, the red bar, weighed 88 kilograms. Those following a pure vegetarian diet, the green bar, only weighed 73 kilograms. Again, a difference of 15 kilograms based on these two different dietary patterns. Okay, what about diabetes? Here they found that carnivorous Adventists in need of being treated for diabetes was 6.3%. On the other hand, the likelihood of developing diabetes over the next seven years and needing medication for it was only 1.6% for plant-based dieters following a pure vegetarian diet. This then represented a four-fold differential between these two dietary groups. The same thing held true for hypertension, a fourfold differential, and the same thing held true for cholesterol. Those following a carnivorous diet 
had a five times greater likelihood of needing treatment for their high cholesterol than those following a plant-based pure vegetarian diet. Diet and chronic disease? What do you think? Is there a relationship? Can we make a case? Let me take you to one more study, a major study, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2017. It's a huge study. It's a major study. It's a monumental study. It's entitled Dietary Factors and Mortality from Cardiometabolic Diseases. This study focused on circulation-related diseases as well as diseases like diabetes. The researchers found that the cardiometabolic mortality rates could be cut in half if people did the following things. Number one, triple the servings of fruits. Number two, at least double the servings of vegetables and legumes. Number three, double the amount of nuts. And number four, increase the servings of whole grains by six times. Did you hear that? Increase the servings of grains. No, 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 whole grains by six times. This means eat more quinoa, more wheat, more oats, eat more barley. <sighs> eat more native foods, foods as they come in nature, foods as grown. You know, the researchers found that if you ate more fruits and vegetables, more legumes, and have some nuts, and particularly if you ate more whole grains, not white flour, but whole grains, you may effectively help yourself in delaying mortality from heart disease and diabetes. But they said you had to do something else. You had to cut out the meats as much as possible. They said you had to get the meat consumption down to 100 grams a week. Now, you know, I mean, 100 grams a week, that is 14 grams a day. I mean, I mean, you might as well forget it. It's not worth the effort, is it? So you had to really, really cut back on meat. With processed meat being now associated with cancer, they recommended zero processed meat. They also recommended zero sugar-sweetened drinks and cutting the salt consumption in half. These simple dietary changes, more fruits, more vegetables, more legumes, more nuts, more grains in particular, and cutting back significantly on meats and eliminating processed meats and sugary beverages and cutting salt in half, they predicted that the mortality from common cardiometabolic diseases could be cut in half. An incredible health outcome, an incredible benefit that could come to us if we're willing to make some simple dietary changes. Let me put it together for you into this eating continuum. If you're on the left-hand side, in the red triangle, this is probably a typical American diet. Lots of meat, lots of dairy, lots of eggs, processed foods, lots of sodium, alcohol, caffeine, and soda. And if you could begin to cut back on these foods, reduce the frequency and the amount, and progress moving towards the right-hand side into the green triangle, you would then be eating more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, lots of beans, some nuts with plenty of water to drink. And this would have a powerful effect on your level of health and your life expectancy. You see, it will make a lot of difference on your health outcome because you see on top, on the left-hand side, you see the words worst health outcomes. This is where the chronic diseases are. They reside on the left side. On top, but this time on the right-hand side, you see the words best health outcome. This is where you find people that are 80 years, 90, 100, 105 years of age. That's where you find the Dr. Warehams and the Marge Jettons. And uh, you find the people here that are still swimming and doing their daily 10,000 steps, even though they're in their 90s and 100 years. They're following a diet of very simple fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, some nuts, and they drink plenty of water. So let me summarize. The experts have estimated that in the United States, 
up to 80% of chronic disease and premature death could be prevented by making significant changes in diet and in lifestyle. In addition, they have found they would also extend their life expectancy by 7 to 14 years. Just extra life, extra years, extra vitality by making simple lifestyle changes. May I leave these questions with you as we close? What would happen if we applied these preventive lifestyle-related strategies to existing chronic diseases? And you may ask yourself the question, well, sir, that's nice uh, that you can prevent these diseases, but what about me? I already have heart disease, I have diabetes, I already have high blood pressure, I'm already struggling with overweight. What am I supposed to do? Is it too late for me? And the answer is no. And here's the next question. Could we influence then these killer diseases? Yes. Could we arrest and disarm and perhaps even reverse these chronic killer diseases that are basically incurable in terms of medications and procedures? Could we make lifestyle changes and actually disarm these diseases and cure these diseases? I'm really eager to offer you some solutions in my next lecture entitled Fork and Knife, Instruments of Hope, Health and Healing reversing and disarming chronic diseases. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Mm -hmm.